In your sermon last week in the story of the Sino-Phoenician woman, which until one starts to understand parables, sounds quite appalling. I find it hard to reconcile Jesus at this time being so human while being divine. Very human in this context, sad, tired and discriminating. I guess most would have been shocked at the dog connotation to an outsider from Jesus. When I try to come to grips with the divine. So can you open that up for me a bit, please? No, I can't. <laughs> um, next question. <laughs> I haven't got enough questions. <laughs> All right, then. OK, ask the question again. Let me tune it. <laughs> right, I'll do a chop there. We'll have a breath, right? <laughs> can you open that up for me a bit, please? No. <laughs> Right, that. Okay, try it again. Okay, can you open it up for me? Okay, let me, let me open it up. <laughs> this is a... Let me start on another question. <laughs> oh dear. I just wish I could say what everyone expects me to say and then live happily ever after. And you'll have people on your tongue, <laughs> yes. Because you know you're lying. Okay, so look, I think this needs careful nuance and untangling. I think there's a lot at stake here, and I'm just wondering what, what the unsaid assumptions are. So are we saying that if Jesus is divine, then he has to be perfect? Are we equating perfection with divinity? And is perfection there, or not being perfection, sinning or being in sin or not? So if he's not perfect, then he's not divine, then he's sinning. Is, is that the equation? Or? I don't know, is it? What, what, what's, what's going on? What, what is the offence? So the offence is that he's tired. Hmm. But why can't he be tired? <laughs> you can't... You, you, of course you can be tired, that's all. I think, I think because it all, to me, the divine, you know, the, I thought it came into it somewhere that, or we assume that Jesus is divine at that stage. And I, I find it hard to reconcile. It, if it comes back to ourselves, when we carry on like we do at times, yes. <laughs> by being very yes. human. Yes. <laughs> We're certainly not divine or trying to be divine, but we're, in a way, letting, letting God down by carrying on the way we are. Okay. <laughs> All right, let, let's try again. So the question is, if Jesus is divine, where does his fatigue and racial prejudice fit in? Mm. Is that the question? Probably. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can do this. I don't feel very well today. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> let's scrap that question. We'll see if we've got enough to carry on with the rest of it. No, no, no. No, I just have to I just have to tune in because I was aware I was expecting something like this. Okay. So I think when I approach Jesus in Mark's gospel, I want to accept him as being fully human. So being fully human implies that he goes through the, the journey of and the adventure of growing to full maturity like the rest of us do. So in the same way that he has to learn to crawl and walk and the normal physical journey of maturity, so to does he need to undergo a, a psychological, emotional, and, and even spiritual evolution? And I think what's happening here is we see that opened up for us. So at this point in the story, he's challenged the Pharisees because they are excluding certain members with, within the Jewish tribe from participating fully within the religious and spiritual life of Judaism. So he's challenging them to be more open. And what happens here is he's confronted with his 
own claim for inclusivity, hospitality and welcomed and challenged not only to open the not open, not only open his welcome to excluded members of the Jewish faith, but even non-Jews. Mm. So what we see unfolding here is a journey of spiritual maturity, maturity. which you would expect from, from any, anyone that's fully human. So I, I sometimes worry within the Christian faith that as we look at Jesus, we don't actually grant him his status as being fully human. No. We kind of look at the scripture and perhaps our perspective is, is somewhat colored. So we almost expect a type of Superman figure. Yes. Mm. You know, that mm. he's, we say he's human with our lips, but in our hearts and our minds, we don't expect him to be fully human. No. So therefore, we're surprised when he's human. Yes. yes. And that shouldn't come as a surprise if we accept that he is fully human. So in the Gospel of Mark, uh, it's nowhere in the Gospel of Mark uh, do we have the divinity of Jesus brought up as a significant theme. In fact, from Mark chapter 1, he's... He's the son of man, the supremely human one. So it's his humanity that's emphasized. Mm. So when we as a Christian faith community say that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, it's my understanding that our journey of understanding the full divinity of Jesus was an experience that became real for us after the resurrection after yes mm. so after the resurrection when people experience the presence of jesus the christ in a more powerful and full way that was the realization that jesus is fully divine right. we're trying to pin what came later just on top of the other without I think so. Yes. Mm. So the realization of, of his full divinity mm. was Wasn't a realization that the Christian community grew to mm. um, post resurrection. But people experiencing Jesus would anticipate the full humanity of Jesus mm. and are surprised when he is human, mm. when he is tired. Yes when he bleeds and every other experience of humanity um, is, is a commentary on, on our perspectives and our attitudes and our um, approach to Jesus. So I think that's, that's one perspective. But if you try to also step into the, the narrative of the writer of the text, you can actually see how it unfolds. So we have the journey of expanding the welcome to previous excluded classes within the Judeo tradition. Hmm. And now the circle of inclusion goes one step wider to include Gentiles as well. So I think it's really powerful. So the word Christ isn't a surname for Jesus. The word Christ means anointed one. So if my reading of the scriptures is correct, when is the first time that we have a Christ anywhere in the scriptures? Well, I think it might be either with Abraham or Jacob. So Abraham is touring away from Ur and he experiences God. God comes close to him. He comes so close to God and to recognize the presence of God in that place, what happens? He builds an altar. Mm -hmm. Jacob seems to follow that tradition because he has this dream, and in the dream there's this ladder that connects earth and heaven, mm -hmm. Jacob's ladder, and what's the first thing he does is he takes the rock that he slept on and he pours oil on it, anointing the oil, and that becomes Bethel, uh, the place of God. So who's, 
who's the Christ in this story? Who's the anointed one? I think it's a Syrophoenician woman. She's the anointed presence uh, with, within that. I also think in the Western tradition, we make too close a link between divinity and perfection. Right. I think our link is that to be divine is to be totally perfect yep. without error. But then that doesn't allow for any process. So my interpretation of, of the divinity within Jesus at mm. this moment is not that he's perfect, but that he's open. So I think that's a significant thing about Jesus is, is that he can be that open, that he can anticipate receiving anointing from someone so far out of his tradition. Yes. So that then follows down <clears throat> to, um, to social reconciliation or, or inclusion that, that you were talking about of each of us to our innermost discriminations that, that you asked. <clears throat> we can repent and pray and repent and pray and then that problem just pops up again. Mm. <laughs> and I'm back to where I started. It's just struck me, I don't think I've ever really forgiven myself for this problem that I keep praying about, so maybe I haven't really asked God to forgive me anyway. But anyhow, childhood indoctrination is very deep in that respect of having to try and repent and repent. Yes, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that repentance is the right spiritual practice in this tradition. Right. And I, I wouldn't be, as individuals, I wouldn't anticipate us beating ourselves up over that. We, we are who we are. Mm. What I, I, a spiritual practice that I think is powerful in moving us forward is the spiritual practice of hospitality uh, to the outsider. And in my experience, when I've witnessed this happening, deep personal and social transformation happens. So I come from a country whose very identity was based on drawing these lines of distinction between us and them. So was my childhood. So was your childhood. Mm. So in, in the practice of the church, uh, one of the things I noticed um, in the Methodist tradition was these pilgrimages of pain and hope. So what happened was people from predominantly white areas which were taken into predominantly black areas. And we were just asked to listen to each other's stories. And you can actually, you can actually physically see the barriers between people dissolving as there's listening and, mm. and speaking Ooh. that happens. It's quite significant that after this encounter with the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus heals that young boy yes. who's both, uh, he's deaf and he's dumb. Mm. And that is a very powerful symbol because in order for the hospitality to difference to take, in order for that to, to take place, uh, those with power need to have the ability to listen. Yes. So they need to be healed of their deafness. Yes. And those without power need to have their tongues healed so that they can speak. And, and I see that's how it happens. I so like with that. Yeah, yeah, so with that Methodist training, I often did that uh, with, within my own church practice, within the Anglican church. And I have clear memories of watching this happen when I was an Anglican priest. I took some members of my predominantly white church into the black areas that I was serving. Mm. And I deliberately forced them to leave their wallets behind. This wasn't going to be an occasion where we reprieve our guilty conscience at our privilege no. by throwing money at the problem. No. Mm. This was merely sit in front of a person and listen and listening to mm. their story. Mm. And there's a huge amount of humanization that happens at that process. It's, people are humanized 
through this process. The person that can share their story is humanized because they no longer invisible, because someone else can see them because their story's been heard. Mm. And the person listening to the story, their worldview has grown larger. They, they humanized too. Mm. So it's hospitality to different. So the way it looks is very practically inviting someone for dinner. Yes, I was going to say this, is this some, what is something that we can do do here, you, you know, I'm saying, do we at St Bart's actually discriminate against anyone? You know, I wouldn't have thought we did, or not openly, not with our op shop and play place and, and messy church and so on. And, and your litany has changed that it's much more enveloping of other people, but there must, <clears throat> there must be something else that we can do, either in, in or out of the church probably, to be able to not have any fear of discrimination. I mean, we, we're certainly all very much thought of as, you know, white Australian, you know, <laughs> Anglicans <laughs> more than anything. And, and we need to break this down to be able to get closer to people. Mm. Yeah, like so... Like the homeless and the... Yes, yeah, yeah, so, so, so the question is to look around and ask yourself who's missing mm. and, and to think uh, carefully about why it is they they are, are missing and the, the prejudice that's internalised runs deeper than we realise. Mm. There's, there's journal articles written, uh, for example, about um, a certain orchestra that wanted to increase uh, the number of uh, female participation within the orchestra. And so what they thought they would do is to have the people that were auditioning potential members do a blind audition. So there was a cover put between the person auditioning and the people judging. But still it didn't work because the percentage of women remained low. Mm -hmm. And then one of the adjudicators came up with a good idea and that was no one was allowed to wear shoes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the percentages that they were after uh, it, it seemed to no oh, really uh, mm. it seemed to uh, rectify it themselves but it's it's within all our Anglican institutions if you're looking for that as an example so even mm. within our school systems um, dare I say it <laughs> we, we have several female members mm. who are head of senior school yes uh, but at present overall heads of school are still predominantly are still predominantly male yes mm. and, and so it's just a question of uh, what are the what are the biases or prejudice or unacknowledged factors that are still keeping women people of color uh, young people out of those positions <laughs> the men's club yes <laughs> You could unpack that further if you like. <laughs> well, even going as far as the, the Anglican Church, I mean, most of the, I would assume that most of the people that are on boards that are electing these um, principles are usually of the same mind and status, so therefore yeah. they keep doing the same. Mm. Yeah, whereas uh, a lot of research and uh, Harvard is one example that releases research which um, shows how organisations are so enriched by diversity. So mm. we shoot ourselves in the foot uh, mm. with, without that diversity. Yes. Mm. Yeah, so look, I think the story is really empowering. So th the one aspect of the story is, is to say that those who feel that they are excluded by society in whatever way. Mm. I'd hope that if they pray with a Syrophoenician woman, that they'd have the courage and the boldness to speak out persistently as she did. And for the rest of us that are perhaps unaware of internalized bias, in this case, perhaps Jesus could be our role model. Mm.
Um, and as we seek to be divine, if we accept that divinity is about being open, uh, that we would be open to listening to those voices because they are necessary, at least for our own survival.